Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Priya Samant, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you today for this really exciting panel discussion, Democratizing the World of NFTs, uh, popularly known as Non-Fungible Tokens. NFTs are creating frenzy uh, in the global markets, but they also pose uh, regulatory uh, uh, you know, questions for its uh, ever uh, so rapidly evolving technological advancements. I would like to open this session with Mr. Jamshed Mistri, who is joining us today from uh, Mumbai, India. So Jamshed, welcome. Uh, you have been working with the clients, uh, you know, uh, in the entertainment sector uh, across the continents. So uh, can you please start by throwing some light on the international copyrights as they regulate movies and music, which is minted as NFTs, and especially, you know, uh, for the legacy movies, because in India, there's a lot of uh, demand for legacy movies now. So how, what is, what, what do you think about, uh, you know, this whole uh, issue or uh, question that we have? So hi Priya, hi to all of you. Uh, it's night time here in Mumbai, but uh, very happy to be here. Uh, so copyright, as you know, is, is, is very interesting, very universal. So uh, that, that's the best part about the act. Uh, I mean, whether we are in India or whether it's, it's in the US or anywhere else. Uh, the, uh, and, and we've always been used to the, you know, uh, the, the physical aspect of, of the copyright. Uh, act and, and then of course as you know we have several conventions that is you know the Berne Convention and things like that which are international treaties which binds the copyright acts of different countries uh, who are signatories to the convention. Now as a result of that when it comes down to you know something like an NFT I think let's let's be clear I think uh, most of the copyright regimes around the world especially I mean I can talk about India, even as far as the U.S. is concerned. Uh, the, the, you know, the first author, the first owner of the copyright, the artist, or, or in, in the case of the movie. I mean, as you know, copyright is not just a single right. It is a bundle of rights. And it develops as, for example, the movie goes on. So you may have, uh, you know, an actor would have his rights. His screenwriter would have his rights. And ultimately, the producer would also have his rights. So all these rights are there and then, you know, that uh, they're all put together and they're registered normally. So, so uh, when it comes down to actually an NFT, what happens is that by and large, till now, till we see a change in, in the law universally, I think you have to get the permission of uh, the, the owner of, of the copyright as far as an NFT is concerned. Uh, you know, because of the f format and the digital form that it is in, or or even if if it is a physical NFT, still, the the important uh, thing to remember is that uh, if you don't, then you may you know land up uh, you know in in line for uh, a copyright violation. So I think the 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 first principle is always remember that yes, there is somebody who has that right. And that person or uh, the owner of the right can then, uh, you know, assign it. So technically, it's an assignment that that happens in uh, in the process. So I'll, I'll pause here for a minute. Sure. So uh, tell tell us, you know, because India is a is a very large market, and there are so many players across the world who have interest in this market uh, per se, with you know blockchain and the evolving of uh, NFT uh, marketplaces opportunities. What is the current situation um, of uh, NFT policies in India, and what should uh, artist community, musician community, and uh, businesses uh, expect in coming months? So, uh, you know, the good piece of news is that currently we are completely unregulated. Uh, there are uh, cases that have, uh, you know, uh, gone to court. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India had tried to ban it completely as far as crypto is concerned, but that was overruled by our Supreme Court. And uh, uh, currently, in, in fact, in this winter session of parliament, they were supposed to come up with some 
uh, you know, legislation, which they haven't. So there's, a, I'm sure, a lot of backdoor, you know, uh, uh, discussion happening in, in this, uh, this space. And uh, let us see, of course, you know, uh, the minute it comes out in some form or the other, it will be subject to, you know, challenge in court, which is, uh, you know, far more easier to do in India than perhaps in, in other countries. Uh, so, so, so currently, so there is no ban technically, uh, which, is, which is good. Uh, you know, you can uh, own NFTs in India. There's not a problem. But the problem is, you know, in, if, if it is uh, in, in cryptocurrency, then the, the wallet, etc., that is a little bit of a problem today. So, you know, where do you open it? How do you get things transferred, etc.? So that, that's, that, that's the position today. But I'm, a, you know, an eternal optimist. I think, you know, things are going to change and, you know, we're going to see uh, the marketplace opening up far, far more sooner than uh, people can imagine. That, that's my little bit on this. See, optimism is what keeps the world alive, right? There's there's always hope uh, and we all live on by that. So uh, speaking about the opportunities in India, uh, I want to um, move to Atharvan Jamshit. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, so uh, Atharva, uh, you know, this is uh, the world of NFTs is a very evolving space. Uh, so when the stakes are high uh, with, uh, say, a high budget movie or a high profile celebrity drop, how are the expectations managed for a uh, for an NFT drop as everything is traceable on blockchain? So there's there's a lot of you know stakes uh, involved from from a perspective of a business uh, you know and the celebrity. So how how are those expectations managed? Um, so so you know I, I think this whole um, activity of managing expectations uh, starts at the level of uh, education. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, we are at a very uh, early stage. So understanding and interpretations of uh, NFT opportunities are quite limited. Um, and we work with uh, clients from entertainment and sports. So these are actually the people who are at the cutting edge of uh, most uh, technologies. And in terms of NFTs, they are actually way more advanced than uh, most of their peers in other uh, sectors. But having said that, the, the point of reference that uh, Indian IP owners are currently using to kind of uh, get a sense of how valuable their IP is if it gets converted to NFTs, the point of reference often being used is Western brands, you know. So somebody like, uh, if, say, if, if, if a company like Marvel does a drop of its uh, comic number one and that sells for a million dollars, does that automatically mean that an Indian comic will also sell for that kind of a valuation? Most likely not, right? But then I think... Um, this is where our job comes in that we have to take the initiative to kind of uh, educate uh, the audiences on the fact that uh, India is not traditionally known to be a collectibles or a collector's market, whereas the West has had the culture of uh, trading cards and collectibles for multiple decades now. And that culture has now very nicely and smoothly kind of uh, evolved into the culture of collecting uh, NFTs. So we are at the stage where today we are actually talking about first creating that collector's culture and then bringing them to the uh, verge of uh, buying and trading uh, NFTs. So I think it's a long uh, it's a long way to go still. But I know for a fact that uh, blockchains like Tezos and stuff are actually trying to build, to bring NFTs to the Indian market in a mass market fashion for as low as uh, 10 rupees so that it becomes uh, something that even school kids can uh, dabble with. So I think uh, from an opportunity point of view, this is like a five to seven year journey to get uh, parity with uh, Western uh, NFT trading vo vo volumes, but we will get, get there. And I think uh, expectation setting starts with uh, education and we actually make it a point um, to give certain, I, I guess the education is very customized uh, to who the client is, what their particular needs are. But nonetheless, the education is primarily based on the fact that we should not simply peg the value of NFT IP based on certain Western trends. That is not a fair comparison to be doing. So uh, you're saying so there is a huge divide between uh, the classes and the masses, uh, how you how I see it from what you have mentioned. But there's also a huge opportunity to bridge that and uh, bring that gap together. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think uh, the uh, other thing to note is that, you know, collectible NFTs maybe are not the best format of NFTs for the Indian audiences, but something like a utility NFT or a gaming NFT 
uh, that, that that is something that for, something for which people have a lot more uh, appetite. And uh, based on the drops which we have done so far, we've kind of seen a similar uh, response pattern wherein collectible NFTs uh, take too long to sell or sometimes don't sell, whereas the um, utility and gaming NFTs are generally much uh, faster moving. Wonderful. So see, the competition is fierce, especially in the entertainment and the sports industry. Um, I was just reading the other day, uh, Viacom 18, T-Series, um, you know, and many other known entities have now announced their forays um, into this uh, into this market. Uh, how can a startup uh, face this fierce competition with no access to the network? Because what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing is, right, um, there are great ideas that are coming out of this space, you know, great startups coming, but, you know, everybody is trying to get that piece of uh, the, the entertainment or the sports, uh, you know, uh, network, but and the competition is fierce. So sometimes, so what, what do you think uh, about that? Uh, so I think, I mean, I can only say something based on my own um, experience. With this, uh, d- 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 but even we did not have that kind of a network access when we got started. And we actually wanted to start with sports and entertainment, the most difficult markets to crack. Uh, what we realized is that by the time we even went to pitch to these uh, IP holders, the likes of uh, Dapper Labs and Animoca brands of the world had already, you know, made their pitch kind of uh, to an, in, in certain transactions. They had already de- deposited minimum guarantees and so on. And a lot of that IP was already locked by these uh, early movers and the very well-funded companies. So I think very early on, we had the we had the, be- the benefit of uh, pivoting to a slightly uh, different model. And um, that is basically the fact that currently most of the work which we do with our clients is not around collectible NFTs uh, anymore. It is around, around utility NFTs, which basically serve as access passes or tickets to metaverse applications that are build, being, being built for um, entertainment IP owners and sports teams. So to give you an example, uh, we are, for example, building a cricket stadium in the sandbox uh, metaverse. But in that stadium, there will be certain fan-only events which can be accessed to holders of that particular NFT. And that and if that particular access NFT is uh, what we sell, not the general cricket team's uh, memorabilia and collectible uh, items. So I think the takeaway over here is that as a startup, uh, we have the benefit and the agility of uh, pivoting to the various components that are being, being built in the Web3 world. So be it uh, building a fan community DAO, being be, be it uh, building a metaverse application, an NFT storefront. Um, I think the, the only key is that uh, we have to pitch um, and close what is uh, available in terms of uh, the, the open deals, uh, so to say, because uh, that, that there is a monopolistic pattern. For example, in India itself, ICC has already given their rights. Uh, BCCI has pledged most of their rights. So have most of the I, I, IPL teams. And... Apart from cricket, all these sports put together don't even contribute half of the fan engagement that cricket does. So yeah. because cricket is the low-hanging fruit and the best um, market to go after NFTs, it becomes very crucial to somehow crack your way into it. And I think the only way to crack into cricket or any other high value for that matter is to give that IP holder something unique, something that they may not have already engaged some other company for. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, you brought uh, the topic of uh, minimum guarantees. So, um, you know, I would love to come back to it because that's a discussion itself uh, when we talk about NFTs and, you know, celebrities uh, uh, in India. But I would like to move now. Uh, speaking about startups, um, and my question is to Kapil. Uh, NFT marketplaces are sprouting by the hour, okay, as, as we speak. But the growing market is um, space is very susceptible to the abuse and the financial crime by the bad players. Um, how can one do uh, due diligence on such players or specific NFTs? Hi, Priya. Thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, so I think if you look at from uh, due diligence and regulatory standpoint, uh, there are some uh, very similar sort of nuances with the uh, at crypto market, uh, the DeFi tokens in particular, um, if I break down the sort of challenges with due diligence now, or regulatory aspect, number one is just proving the authenticity of the assets that uh, NFT is actually backing or uh, based on. Uh, then KYC of uh, the seller and uh, buyer. And then uh, AML, uh, especially with the Russian war, there are uh, talks about can Russia now evade some of the sanctions by using NFTs uh, because I think the crypto, especially some of the macro assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum, AML uh, has 
technology has improved quite dramatically. Um, as far as the first one, when it comes down to sort of proving the authenticity, uh, I think that the whole point of NFT as a technology, it's, uh, it's, it's if you look at sort of an underlying object architecture, it's a tamper-proof token minted directly on the blockchain. Uh, the way uh, they are designed, they're supposed to be publicly traceable. They give you the mean to verify the origin and essentially prove the digital asset for the first time that you couldn't do in, in any other sort of kind of centralized mechanism. Uh, with that comes the challenge of uh, sort of, uh, we were talking about the IP issues that Mr. Jamshed were touching upon. Uh, but uh, uh, knowing, uh, doing your due diligence is the most important part. Uh, knowing the marketplace where you are buying is absolutely important. Like you said, uh, there are marketplaces and platforms coming up uh, by hour. Um, it's very similar to if, as if you want to go in DeFi world, you want to put your MetaMask, you don't know who your counterparty is in the DeFi world. So that's a risk that crypto community is already taking. The institutional community is not taking that risk. The institutional community, community is still sitting outside the, the decentralized finance world. They are using centralized platforms. So that's where... Uh, uh, platforms like yourself, platforms like us, who are providing these uh, uh, add-on like KYC or AML type of services are where you should that one should definitely go. So you can actually trust the platform that is offering these platforms, uh, these, these NFTs. Um, KYC is, is an important issue. Uh, the issue exists in DeFi. That's why the centralized places are, again, platforms are the places where the, the, the platform is KYCing the buyer and seller. And then the money laundry. I think uh, NFT forensic analysis technology is developing. Uh, companies like Elliptic, Chain Analysis, Cypher Trace, they do a phen phenomenal job in tracing any sort of fund movements from source to destination. So uh, overall, I think if you want to play safe, uh, playing with a centralized platform is, is the way to go. Uh, but the technology itself is evolving and definitely posing, keeping relators awake. Yes, they are. And, um, you know, um, each one of you is answering, um, uh, you know, and bringing so many unique points that, you know, there can be a session separately just to <laughs> talk about those uh, issues. But uh, you brought up Russia. So, um, you know, I mean, I don't know how much we can see each other, but, you know, I'm wearing yellow and uh, blue uh, in support of uh, what's happening currently in Ukraine. But with the current Russia-Ukraine conflict, um, this war is in time of crypto. You know, NFTs are being created for fundraising and they are used as war bonds. Um, so what is your take on it? Because you have rightly mentioned, uh, you know, with with crypto coming in and, uh, you know, no hold on the sanctions in that world. What what is uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think, I mean, for the past uh, since the invention of Bitcoin, we all have been talking about different use cases for crypto. And one of the most important one that has been talked about is the speed, how fast uh, now the assets can move without going through the banking system. So Ukraine is in the dire need of help and moving any sort of help through traditional channels like Red Cross or other uh, sort of uh, traditional banking infrastructure. By the time help reaches, it will be over for them. So crypto has now stepped in. The actual use case why crypto was designed for is now we're seeing the real example in front of us where if I want to donate to Ukrainian people, I can simply send uh, my Bitcoin through multiple charity organizations who are offering it. In fact, across Tower, we help a lot of charity organizations to take Bitcoin. Um, NFT is, uh, again, another sort of kind of like an asset class that's being seen. Um, believe at this point, I believe some of the macro assets are still a bad way to like Bitcoin and ETH, which are liquid. Like if you're getting the help, you can actually liquidate some of those assets into local currencies and then actually use to buy groceries, to buy food. Uh, the secondary market for NFT still hasn't evolved. Yeah. Uh, so you can't really use that other than just to kind of protect your assets. 
Um, that's another. The, then the other important part is uh, sanctions, right? So there is a claim about like can Russia evade sanctions by using NFTs, by using uh, uh, crypto, uh, and, and kind of like shutting down the banking system. Is it actually causing problem? Uh, jury is still out there, but again, this is an eye-opening event uh, happening or history in, in the making, where the governments need to start taking uh, sort of crypto much more seriously and looking at uh, the sort of kind of pros and cons of the technology itself. Just thank you, thank you so much, Kapil, on sharing uh, you know your thoughts. Uh, so, uh, talking about governments and diplomacy, I would now like to move to Shrina. Um, Shrina, you're running for your candidate uh, for the U.S. Congress. Um, so, uh, please let me know: Are NFTs a medium of increasing personal connection with voters? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's something that, especially with our campaign for Congress now, what we're looking at is what are the interests of the people, right? When we talk about, I actually really appreciated some of the points that Tharva was making earlier around what are the differences in the markets, right? Between what the Western markets are seeing, what uh, the Indian market is seeing and what people actually want. And ultimately, a lot of the uh, members of the U.S. government have honestly been sort of avoiding talking about crypto and making, you know, steps forward in terms of what innovation could look like and therefore what the regulatory uh, framework needs to look like. But I think that is an opportunity now where we can say, hey, look, you know, we have 27 million people in the U.S. that actually do own crypto currently, right? We have 30 percent of 18 to 29 year olds that are engaging with crypto. And so it's responsibility as a legislator to say, what are the interests of the American people? People and how do we make sure that we are creating uh, the regulatory frameworks that actually allow innovation to continue to thrive rather than stifle it? But of course, um, to the points earlier that Kapil was making around KYC, AML, and CFT, right? We we have to make sure that we do have the uh, the right frameworks in place to actually have uh, an understanding of where uh, these assets are, right, while protecting people's privacy. And so I think for me, it ultimately comes down to representing the interests of the American people and also really wanting to make sure that we're allowing innovation to continue to thrive. Wonderful. So um, there is a huge learning curve here, okay, well, be it the U.S., India, Europe, or any, any other any other market. For the U.S., do you see uh, extensive uh, adoption of NFTs as a tool for fundraising um, as we will be approaching the 2024 elections? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of really great interest um, across the board. It's been quite fascinating, actually. We did our, our first drop at the end of uh, the last year in 2021, and we had major publications reaching out to us saying, what did you just do? Can, can you explain to us what just happened? And a lot of these conversations are actually the reason why we're doing this, right, is to educate a lot of the mainstream population that this is something that's happening. This is something people are excited about. And we do think that it can create an additional pathway to have real conversations, right? The way that a an NFT community has a Discord server and people are talking and talking about, in this case, potentially the future of policy. Um, I think there's a real use case for an NFT to potentially allow a more direct line of communication and also foster uh, the ability for people to say, this is what we think policy should do, right? To, you know, it's, it's, it could be the, the new version of a town hall, right? The same mm -hmm. way that um, you can have access to a, a new communication platform within an NFT community. Why can't we do the same and have someone who's, you know, 34 years old and would probably never go up the street to their downtown and attend a town hall meeting, but they might, you know, comment on a Discord server, right? And mm -hmm. so I think for me, it's creating new pathways for people to engage. And when we talk about the future of the internet, when we talk about the future of crypto, of course, we talk about decentralization, about ownership, um, but the fundamental aspect of Web3 is access, right? And so how can we ensure that this value that is so important to the future of this technology actually make its way back into how we're regulating it. Absolutely. I completely agree. It's access and access to all and inclusion. So, you know, uh, that's that's very important. So um, with that, now I would like to move to uh, Q Harrison. And thank you so much, Srina, for sharing your insights. Um, 
NFT is a buzzword, but metaverse is 10 steps ahead of it. Uh, I have a 13 year old who I see doesn't know much about what it is, but just talking about it is sounds very cool to him. So metaverse is uh, kind of a, a discussion in our home. Uh, so uh, Q, um, uh, could you let us know um, or explain rather, what is the relationship between a metaverse and NFTs? Great question. So the way I look at it is I see the metaverse in many ways as the, the next evolution of the internet, right? So we have the internet as, we have, as we've known it, how we're talking right now through this video conferencing uh, software run the world. And we've been on Zoom calls, we have web pages, but most of that exists on black screens and 2D environments, right? And the metaverse that's being proposed in, in, or many metaverses that have been proposed, I don't know which one's going to win out, yeah. but the, the, the actual like basis of it is that we're going to move into the spatial internet. So there's going to be a 3D uh, element, very similar to what you've seen in video games, how you're, you're living in these you know, virtual worlds or economies that exist in our everyday lives in the same way that you'll have um, a... A, 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 a digital copy of you that is, you know, created by the camera and it's, it's sent to this 2D, you know, platform. You can see it on this website, on this video side, you would have like a, a digital twin or an avatar in like these virtual worlds known as the metaverse. Uh, what's fascinating about it is if we have a virtual world, you're going to need a virtual economy. And in order to establish that virtual economy, the way I see NFTs is one way to create precedent around what is a digital uh, ob what is a digital asset or a digital collectible that has value that can't be uh, intrinsically copied or shared in a way that, you know, is, is not prohibited by the smart contract. So I, I, I think that digital scarcity element is how NFTs and the metaverse kind of coexist uh, to give it a little bit more grit. I think uh, the, the number one used example is like Fortnite. So, you know, your 13 year old son can hop in Fortnite. Uh, when he gets there, he has a currency that he has to exchange. So it'll take, you know, USD and exchange that for V-Bucks. Those V-Bucks are then uh, like a fungible token that can be used to to, to get access to uh, skins and in-game assets that are more non-fungible, but not really, right? In the sense that like they're limited or they're rare, or there might only be several thousand of these and millions of players, right? And so you, you, you have that really mimicking itself in the larger world through uh, cryptocurrency and NFTs. And so when we enter the metaverse, uh, some of the digital assets that you have that go from, you know, with you from place to place will be NFTs. At least that's how I see it. So uh, do you think that NFTs affect the metaverse economy or there is something else that will come up? So I, it's, you never know technology, right? It's like programming languages. Like, you know, there was a point where there was a, the, the, the precedent to creating an app was Objective-C and then, you know, something changed and it, it switched over to Swift um, for, for iOS apps at least. And when I, I think about it, it's like, you know, the format, the standard right now is the, the NFT, like the smart contracts that are powering NFTs are a great, you know, proof of concept. We're seeing what it looks like at scale right now. But, you know, the thing about it is, you know, technology, emerging technologies can constantly evolve and build on top of, you know, what we've learned. So I think fundamentally right now, there's a long road ahead for the NFTs and smart contracts in general. But there, there's, there's definitely a lot of developers trying a lot of different things um, in all assets. And maybe we find, you know, there's there's more innovation to be had on the wallet side and there's better tokens to, to interact with that, you know, can you have some duality to it. But I think we're many years away. So, um, you know, um, I'm going to um, ask uh, some common questions that, you know, anyone of you all um, in any order can take it. Um, what do you think is the future of NFTs? Okay, how uh, do we play an exercise? We start with Jamshed and we come back to Q <laughs> and we go in the same order. No, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, especially if you're looking at it from the uh, the art perspective, I think uh, I mean, art as uh, the creative uh, side, I, I think this is uh, the, I mean, there, there is no sort of uh, limit to, you know, what you can do with it. You know, I, I think as it sort of develops, I mean, 
for example, who would have thought that from a, a landline today you have a, a satellite phone? I mean, you know, and I'm just giving you that uh, kind of a, uh, a scenario. And uh, you know, similarly with uh, I mean, you can do so many things. And and what constitutes an NFT is is, is also I mean, you can you know expand uh, the scope. It can be traditional, non-traditional. It can be you know, so many things. So the objective is, I think, to uh, you know, encourage it to, to ensure that you know people are aware of it and then uh, ultimately own it. I think that's a simple two three step way of uh, you know, moving ahead. So. Yeah, I think NFTs will basically take take over in uh, many other uh, applications beyond uh, art, entertainment, and sports. Um, so you know, I think um, in the next. Uh, Three to five years, everything from uh, receipts of expensive items all the way to land records, documents, um, items like birth certificates, certificates, all of these kind of, uh, you know, whatever. So basically all kinds of important documents, probably receipts of high value items, uh, most in-game per, per purchases would become um, NFTs. Um, of course, uh, within this, there, is, there, are, there will be a lot of uh, nuances. Uh, but I think the other big trend with uh, NFTs would become the trend of uh, interoperability. So which which would mean that if you get a NFT in one game and that game is uh, built on a particular uh, virtual world environment, most likely there will be technology that will enable you to bridge that NFT to a different game, use it in a different way and so on. So that, what, so that set of NFTs which you hold have utility in multiple metaverses, hopefully multiple games and uh, in multiple uh, other utility platforms but i think that they will take over um, way beyond just uh, art and music and uh, movies it will be in a lot of other day items hi i'll go next uh, having network difficulty hope you guys can still hear me uh, yeah yeah, I, think, can hear you. yeah I, I break down uh, sort of the power of this technology into two parts one is uh, underlying principles of blockchain which is the disintermediation peer-to-peer transactions so that would the fact that an artist can actually directly reach to its audience, to its fan, without uh, relying on some of the intermediary distribution platforms, uh, such as iTunes, YouTube, Spotify. We will see a Netflix movie distribution. We will see a dramatic uh, sort of impact on those uh, entertainment distribution platform. They may or may not play a role. Uh, probably what Netflix did to Blockbuster. Somebody in NFT is going to do the same to Netflix, uh, unless Netflix catches up. Uh, We know YouTube is jumping into NFT space for the same reason. Uh, The other aspect is, uh, I think what he was talking about, just the infinite possibilities of uh, metaverse coming out of pandemic. We all have learned to live our life on internet. Uh, practically, we are just watching screens and we are walking around on the streets. We're sitting, we're having dinners on the screens. We're living in a metaverse. Um, so the the life uh, in, in situations like war and pandemic can go, you can, you got to keep going. And metaverse gives you that sort of ability to interact with other humans without physically being there. So there's just a lot of potentials uh, from completely two different angles. Very well put. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think asking this question is like asking the future of the internet, right? Before <laughs> before it happened. And so I, I wish I had a magic ball that I could look into and uh, that would tell me the, the future of NFTs. Um, but I think ultimately, especially from my perspective now as a candidate for Congress, what I'm really looking at is how do we make sure that we have the right regulatory framework so that we actually allow the innovation to continue? Right. Um, we're keeping people safe. We're maintaining privacy. We're, we're making sure that we have the right approaches to do KYC and AML and CFT. And we are actually creating a framework that allows people to continue to innovate. Right. If we would have stoppered the Internet because someone got one pop up ad or there was one case of credit card fraud, then we would you know, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so making sure that we're keeping people safe, that we're putting the right guardrails in place. Um, and educating people in terms of how to participate while making sure that the innovation can continue is, um, I think, something that is, is really important. 
you. Yeah, no, on the, the future of NFTs, I, I think it's like twofold. Uh, first, you know, I'm glad that we're one year into it, right? In the sense that, you know, it's, it, NFTs have been mainstream for uh, exactly, or all, yeah, exactly. It's March 2022, uh, so exactly about a year. And what's beautiful about that is a lot of the first movers that moved into it that had ill intent, they've been pushed out. They're now trustless, right? They, they don't really have trust. A lot of people have been rugged. And so a lot of the scams, that's out of the marketplace. Like where people have a, a baseline level of knowledge. And if it's not you directly, it's the person next to you that's like thinking about it. And they're saying, hey, don't do that. Or don't share your, your private key. Or, you know, be careful what links you click on. And I'm glad that the scam era is, is, is starting to, to conclude um, because that opens up great possibilities. When I think about the future of NFTs, I see uh, memories, right? Like all of the digital documents that we create. When you think about yourself as a person, how many mm-hmm. photos have you taken? How many documents have you worked on? How many projects have you, have you seen? How many things have you invested in? Uh, all of that, there's a digital byproduct of it, right? And in, 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 in these devices, our phones, our laptops, all of those things create digital uh, native, like, digital native products that exist. And in that, uh, there's an ability where you know I can start, I can really see a future where we're all walking uh, just databases that have like files or assets that like almost have a value. Like when I think about the future of a, uh, of a person, right. And like, I know that there's, we've always talked about the tokenization of, of people and like, you know, there's people that have like uh, tokenized their future earnings. I think that that's kind of stupid because if I were going to go out in the market and maybe I'll do this, uh, I would tokenize all the things that I create. And that in its essence, in its essence is a bunch of one of ones, but it creates the value in who I am as a person. And there's also intrinsic unique traits that like, if I worked with like this, this talk could be an NFT, right? And it's like all six of us are contributors and we could take that out into the marketplace and there could be six NFTs and there's value in owning that. And I think that that's how the world's going to really uh, move maybe like 20 to 30 years from now, right? Because in the same way, when if we take a picture and we know how to store that on, a, uh, on our internal storage of our phones and we can upload it and email it and, and like the standards are there for that. Like we jump back 20 years, like putting a picture on a flash drive and giving that to somebody was like a big, big deal. And like flash drives weren't even that big. Like, you know, one gigabyte was like what we would consider like 10 terabytes today. And the, the crazy thing about that is like we're moving towards a future where like digital objects, digital files have value. And that to me is just mind blowing. They, they, you know, very well said. Um, I, I actually was reading one of your, um, uh, uh, I think it was an article about, you know, we have to start planning what happens uh, for to the NFTs after, <laughs> after we die, because you know it's it's you know it's just like estate planning. Uh, you know, one has to think in that direction. So I think we still have one question uh, that we can do. I was, I'm just looking, I want to be very mindful of our time. So, um, you know, when we talk about, uh, we have talked about technology part of it, but in today's world, any technology um, to uh, become mainstream or adopted, content is key. Uh, is, is key. Um, and, you know, we spoke about arts and entertainment, but I also want to um, touch upon a bit on the activism and, you know, social impact side. So uh, what do you think? How are content creators going to play a role um, in the social from the social and activism uh, perspective in, uh, you know, you know, promoting uh, uh, drops, uh, you know, NFT drops that come up from that space because with um, uh, the uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict right now, there's a lot of, uh, you know, benefit concerts uh, happening, you know, fundraising happening. So uh, what is your take on that? In the same order. I thought maybe we could have done it in reverse. No problem. Uh, The... uh, no, I think as far as uh, you know, social and uh, you know that space is concerned. I, I mean, you know, there's there's so many uh, areas. Like for example, you know, I I do a lot of public interest litigation, uh, and you know there is a lot of uh, so sort of interesting uh, stuff that happens in court. For example, I mean, you know, today with uh, with live streaming and you know other. Uh, 
areas, uh, you know, including transcription, uh, you can, you know, sort of uh, have have a sort of an NFT of a of, of a mock uh, of of a you know very important you know case which would be you know, sort of uh, put together, and that would be extremely useful for 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 example for legal research for you know, students for for you know, legal fraternity. And uh, they would say, oh, I would be very happy to own a few of these important <laughs> NFTs. I think, so, I mean, it's, it, you know, area to area. And then, of course, you know, uh, it depends. I mean, you say you do work on, you know, uh, for the environment or for, for, for any, any, anything. So all those, uh, you know, the experiences can be sort of, you know, put together and, uh, Again, you know, uh, like uh, I think when we were kids, we had fireball in you know, five, saying that you know you go where no man has gone before and you know, just let your imagination fly. And uh, you know, with uh, metaphors and what you was talking about, and we'd love to have this conversation. You know, maybe a, a year down the line and see what what new <laughs> innovations and technology has led us to. So we have only three minutes together uh, together now. now. So I want, uh, you know, um, if you can uh, keep your answers in a Twitter style format. So, you know, I want to make sure that we all get the opportunity to uh, speak. But thank you, Jamshid, for sharing your thoughts. So, uh, so yeah, let me go next. I, I, I think that, uh, in short, you know, the global uh, community is a, the, a very small portion of it is actually currently technologically savvy enough to be able to uh, participate in uh, NFTs, be it for fundraising or otherwise. So I think um, if, if you really want to use uh, NFTs as a tool for impact, we need to first reduce the mission to get people to make the NFT purchase. So make, make it probably make it easier to do fiat, fiat on, on ramp and other uh, web two type integrations, so that more people can actually purchase NFTs if they wish to. Because currently you have to first have your MetaMask funded with YYN and exchange, then go to a market to buy it. It's a very long process with only the most uh, savvy people can do. So I think from a social standpoint, uh, to be able to reach to the masses, to be able to trace the help from source to the destination is very important, especially in countries where corruption is so high, the help never reaches in 100%. If government wants to put $100 in a, in a farmer's pocket, he probably is only getting $10. 90 is, or whatever the currency is, 90 is getting eaten by the corrupt politicians or the bureaucrats. With the, with this technology, and this is not just NFT, just the blockchain as a technology, traceability is so important. And then I think um, the, the, it's just, it's built for masses and brings financial equality. Yeah, I'm actually, I think there's so much to really get into here. And uh, I know that we only have a minute left. So I actually want to pass it off to Q because I am very interested in hearing what he has to say because a lot of my thoughts have been on the regulatory side of this. So I'll let, I'll let Q have the last minute. Hey, that's what I talk about pressure. I, <laughs> I, I think that it's twofold. One, it's friction, right? So we have to decrease friction and I don't think we're anywhere near where, what, uh, like how we're, into, how we're manipulating and just creating and distributing NFTs reminds me that more of like what a computer programmer was doing to create, you know, JPEG images. There's going to be tools and software suites in the same way that like when we were first putting images on computers, like in the, the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And then like you have uh, software suites like Photoshop and Adobe. Obviously, those weren't the first names, but you get it. You were able to, to move uh, images and then it, it created accessibility and people were like, oh, OK, there's new professions that can that can arrive from this. Uh, the people that are raising money today, I think that like that's the core crux. It's like, how, what am I doing in this space, and how is that allowing uh, value not only for the investors like temporary? Because some people are seeing the prices where things are shooting up 500x or 1,000x. Like we've seen OpenSea go into its crazy valuations, but beyond that, like it's like how are you going to bring in the next hundred million users in in crypto? And they're not going to be as technically savvy. 
Uh, people are going to lose their wallets. So I think like the next big company to be started in the space definitely needs to figure out some form of crypto insurance, even if it's just on the smaller side, right? Like, I don't know if they're going to insure Bored Apes tomorrow or even CryptoPunks tomorrow. But if you could insure like these, like, you know, NFTs that cost less or equal to 1500 bucks per se, that would be a very interesting thing because you could then have companies that are intermediaries go in and onboard new users and teach them things in a, in a safer environment, so to say. So I have to quickly say goodbye, everyone. We are filing papers to get on the ballot today, so I'm headed to the office now. But um, thank you all for taking the time to join us. And uh, it was a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Priya, for bringing us all together. Thank you so much, Rina. So I just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for your time joining today um, on this panel from various parts of the world. Uh, this was a super enlightening session about the future of how blockchain enabled technologies have occupied center stage while the world was in lockdown and while you know uh, many countries are facing crisis. It remains to be seen how disruptive and impactful uh, will innovations like NFT bees. And as uh, Mr. Jamshi Mistri rightly said, till we meet for the next uh, edition of the Harasses, we'll see how this space evolves. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for your time. It was a wonderful session. Good morning and good night. Thank you. Thank you.